aboard! This is the Intergalactic Cruiser. The destination on your ticket is a tour of the local group of galaxies, featuring the Large and Small Magellanic Galaxies, the Orion Nebula, the Andromeda and Triangulum Galaxies, and a few surprises in between. Tickets, please! Be advised you may experience a slight tingling sensation as we rev into hyperspace. The ship and everything in it is going through a dimensional phase change. It's nothing to worry about. The tingling passes quickly. Now, passengers, as we head toward galactic latitude 180 degrees north, as Terrarians are accustomed to calling it, our first main item of interest will be an intense star-forming region known as M42, the Orion Nebula. But first, a special treat by the captain that's not on the advertised itinerary. The Horsehead Nebula! It's off to the port side, that's left for you Aggies. Its designation is M43. The newborn star at the top of the horse's head has a strong solar wind that is deforming the shape of the nebular cloud. Get a good look at it now, because in a few thousand years, those gases will be completely blown away by the star-like nebula that made our sun. Yep, long gone, except for the nebular gases captured by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Okay now, one of our junior explorers asks a question. What is the M in M42 and M43? Well, young lady, the M stands for Messier. Pronounce Messier, not Messier, as in, is your room messier than mine? <laughs> Charles Messier, I mean Messier to be precise, was a French astronomer in the 18th century. He published a catalog of 110 fuzzy objects as seen through an early telescope. The Horsehead Nebula is number 43 on his list. We'll see more M's as we continue our tour. Heads up, we're coming to the Orion Nebula. The gases in the nebula may seem less colorful than you expect. That's because we're accustomed to seeing long-exposure telescopic photos and enhanced photos designed to highlight the different gases in the nebula. May I suggest using the pair of tinted glasses that come with your onboarding packet if you want to heighten your experience. In we go! Now, it's a good thing we are in hyperspace. As we approach the trapezium star cluster in the center, the bright star, Theta C, sends out a solar wind at 5 million miles an hour. It sculpts the whole cloud of gas and dust, creating shock waves that compress nearby stars. Theta C is a megastar, 200,000 times brighter than the sun. It will go supernova in about a million years. I won't be around then. Oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur glow in ionized states like a fluorescent light bulb. Oxygen blue, hydrogen red, some green and sulfur, and dust glow as yellow-orange. As we pull out of the Orion Nebula and rise high above the galactic plane, the spiral arms of the Milky Way are visible. Our sun, which you cannot distinguish from this height above the galaxy, is in the Orion Spur that lies between the outer Perseus arm and the inner Sagittarius arm. Notice the center of the Milky Way contains a bright magnetic bar that plays an essential part in star formation. Over 70% of nearby galaxies include magnetic bars. It's a sign of a mature galaxy. Only 20% of distant galaxies contain magnetic bars in their cores. Which reminds me, passengers, the juice bar is now open. Our H1 server will take your orders. Now, that's the Andromeda galaxy far, far out to the port side. But may I call your attention to the many dwarf galaxies, over 40 of them, that populate our galactic neighborhood. We're heading to one now. The Large Magellanic Cloud, LMC to astronomers, is an irregular dwarf satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, containing about 30 billion stars with a dynamic star-forming region called the Tarantula Nebula, which we will be cruising through shortly. Of course, if there is a Large Magellanic Cloud, there must be a Small Magellanic Cloud, SMC. And there it is, below and to the left of the LMC. The Milky Way will eventually ingest both dwarf galaxies. Some prefer the word accreted, but the result is the same. 
If you use your tinted glasses again, you can see that the LMC has stripped away a tremendous amount of gas from the SMC, as they have interacted gravitationally over millions of years. Hey, I know all about gas. Now we're heading out of the Milky Way to a distance of about 50 kiloparsecs. That's 50,000 parsecs, or about 163,000 light years. So, what's a parsec? No, it's not slang for pair of socks. A parsec is about 3.26 light years. A light year is about 5.88 trillion miles. The word parsec is a combination of two words, parallax and second. Parallax is the shift an object seems to make when viewed from two different perspectives. Looking at an object with your left eye and then your right eye, you'll see the object appear to shift. That's parallax. When an astronomical object is photographed with the Earth on one side of the Sun and then again six months later on the other side of the Sun, the shift is measurable in degrees of arc, or minutes of arc, or seconds of arc, down to milliseconds of arc. That's a parsec, a parallax of one arc second, which turns out to be 3.26 light years. Hey, what about a Joan of Arc? That's how you measure distances in France. <laughs> Meanwhile, since you can't measure a light year with a ruler or a tape measure, parsecs are the scientific way of telling the distance to a star or intergalactic object. The greater the parallax, the closer the object is. The smaller the parallax, the farther away it is. Now, straight ahead in the heart of the Tarantula Nebula is the R136 star cluster. Within a distance of one light year, there are over 40 stars each with a mass over 50 times that of the Sun. Wow! Comparatively, there isn't a single other star within four light years of our home star, Sol. And that's a good thing. You can see Supernova 1987A at about 2 o'clock high. A blue giant star, 100,000 times brighter than the Sun, experienced a core implosion, resulting in a Type II supernova 100 million times brighter than the Sun. It has left behind a neutron star, clouded in dust and gas, and a wildly spectacular display of fireworks. Now, 1987A in the Large Magellanic Cloud is the closest supernova to Earth since 1604, which happened in the Milky Way about 20,000 light years from Earth. It was visible in the daytime for about two weeks, or so. After 1987A went supernova because it was a blue giant star, Speculation has increased that the blue giant star Rigel, the foot star of the constellation Orion, might go supernova in the not-too-distant future, or already has gone supernova. Rigel is approximately 860 light-years from Earth, so anything that happens to Rigel would take about 860 years before it would be noticed on Earth. Supernova 1987A ejected the heavy elements, like cobalt, nickel, and iron, and lighter silicates into the Tarantula Nebula, where they will form the basic building blocks of stars and planets. Our server is now offering space-themed snacks. May I recommend the Jupiter Cotton Candy Puffs for the children on board? Aww. Remember, I know all about gas. Our next stop is the Andromeda Galaxy and Environs. Notice its halo as we leave the Milky Way and its 300 billion stars behind. As many as 150 globular clusters reside in the galactic halo. They orbit down and through the galactic disk and contain some of the oldest stars in the universe. How they got here in our home galaxy is a matter of intense study. You will notice NGC 6822, an irregular dwarf galaxy off to the starboard. NGC stands for New General Catalog of Astronomical Objects. Now you'd think there'd have been an old general catalog, but there wasn't. It was just a new catalog. There is, however, a revised new general catalog which astronomers refer to regularly. Clears that up, huh? As we pass NGC 6822, you'll notice a magnetic bar beginning to form and bright patches of new star formation. This galaxy was discovered in 1884 by E.E. E. Barnard, and is also called Barnard's Galaxy. Mr. Barnard was quite an astronomical observer. 
He has a crater on the moon named for him, one on Mars, an area on Jupiter's moon Ganymede, a minor planet, number 819 Bernardania, and the star with the fastest movement across the sky, Bernard Star. Now, not too many people have their name emblazoned across space as has Edward Emerson Bernard. Approaching the giant Andromeda galaxy with its trillion stars, we will skirt above its western edge and visit one of the enormous galaxy's dwarf companion galaxies, M110 or NGC 205. Yes, it also has two designations. Hey, take your pick. The first of its kind, a dwarf spheroidal galaxy of about 3.5 billion solar masses, M110 or NGC 205 if you wish, has eight globular clusters near its core. It too will be swallowed, or accreted if you prefer, by the Andromeda galaxy. It may have already been stripped of much of its stars and gas, a point highlighted by M110's general lack of star formation. Everybody having fun yet? And now, our final stop, M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, the third and last spiral galaxy of our local group. Located in the small constellation of Triangulum, Latin for triangle, good guess, M33 is about half the size of the Milky Way. The Triangulum Galaxy is 2.7 million light years from Earth, but it is much closer to the Andromeda Galaxy and moving towards it. If two spiral galaxies collide, it may alter the course of the Andromeda galaxy and prevent the predicted collision with the Milky Way. Well, let's hope so. Now, this important message. We will serve dinner on our return trip to Earth. There's a choice of chicken or fish. We hope you have enjoyed the tour. Hey, if you fill out our survey and give us five stars, you can also have dessert. The Milky Way is one of the biggest mysteries out there, literally. It's hard to figure out how big our home galaxy is. And one of the main reasons is because we live in it. Think of it as walking around a mall. You can tell it's big, but you can't be certain until you actually see it from a bird's eye view. The Milky Way consists of billions of distant stars that look like a string of lights from afar. So you just need to measure the distance between these stars and voila, you have the answer. Eh, not really. I might have forgotten to mention opaque clouds of dust blocking your view. Some scientists were stubborn enough to run computer models of how galaxies form and evolve. There's a halo around our galaxy, so the scientists wanted to see if there was some sort of a dead end in the Milky Way. They found out that the Milky Way spreads for 100,000 light-years away from its center. It likely means that the entire galaxy is around 200,000 light-years across. The problem with this estimation is that halos don't tend to have some final border since they simply fade away. It's like pointing a flashlight and trying to see precisely where the light ends. In 2013, the Hubble Space Telescope captured an image of something 25 million light years away. It turned out to be a spiral galaxy, later called ESO 3738, with at least seven other galactic neighbors. And this galaxy is as thin as a pancake. A very shiny pancake. The telescope also took a photo of another galaxy cluster 65 million light years away. It was called IC 335. It's another glorious glittering pancake floating in the vastness of space. The images the telescope took aren't the most accurate. It's hard to tell what exactly you're looking at. These disk galaxies have lots of dust clouds that can stretch for hundreds of light years across. They're mainly located near the centers of galaxies and are invisible in regular light but they can be detected with the help of a blue filter. Anyway, this IC335 galaxy is an oval disk with huge clouds of gas and dust. This means stars constantly appear there. But not all galaxies create stars. A galaxy is born as a giant ball of slowly rotating gas that is steadily collapsing in on itself. As it starts spinning faster and faster, the pancake shape is formed. Ooh, pass me the syrup! It's like spinning pizza dough in the air after rolling it into a ball. The topping is stars, and the sauce is clouds of dust and gas. Are you getting hungry like me? Some galaxies can lose their gas and dust if they become part of a galaxy cluster. Then all these mini-galaxies orbit their common center of mass, with gas separating them. When a disk galaxy dashes through them like a speeding train, the pressure can blow away this dust and gas. 
From far away, it looks like you're staring at a DVD you're about to play. But if you traveled millions of light years to get a closer look, you'd see a dim disk filled with stars. You wouldn't even be able to tell you're inside it. You'd also see a bright blob of dust left by the red giants in the middle of the galaxy. Red giants are massive and very bright stars with low surface temperatures. But the images of these galaxies don't actually show us their real color. Cameras make up some of these hues so that you don't have to look at something fuzzy or grainy. People don't actually know the real colors of distant galaxies. Our galaxy has a lot of gas inside, like me, so we don't need to expect our home to dry up anytime soon. In fact, the Milky Way still produces new stars around 7 a year. But some galaxies fade out when they can no longer create stars. In the industry, they call it strangulation, and it happens when galaxies run out of gas, which means there's no more new material that can be used for star making. Gas and dust aren't the only things you can find in a galaxy. Just like a magician pulling a rabbit, flowers, or other things out of their magic hat, galaxies have other surprises, like planets, those balls of matter spinning around themselves and around other things. Well, technically, planets are far from being perfectly round in shape. But they aren't also flat like spiral galaxies. It's mostly because of gravity. Its force is so strong that a planet pulls everything towards its center, taking the shape of a sphere. In the process, all the edges and anything else that might stick out get smoothed out. But the smaller a space body is, the less round it is. Take a comet. It doesn't always have a smooth surface. It's small, and therefore, its edges are rugged and pointy. Given the size of Earth, it's safe to say the gravity is strong here compared to that of the Moon or any smaller-sized space object. And because of our planet's constant rotation, there's an outward bulge on Earth. This tug-of-war between the gravity pulling inward and the planet's spin doesn't allow Earth to be a perfect ball. On top of Earth not being a perfect sphere, the planet is also tilted. This design flaw is responsible for the seasons we have. This tilt could happen because millions of years after Earth was formed, it probably collided with a protoplanet, a large space body developing into a planet. Venus is unique because it rotates backward compared to the rest of its peers. If you were standing on Venus, the hottest planet in our solar system, you'd see the sun rise in the west and set in the east. But you'd have to make it on time to observe this phenomenon. A day on Venus lasts for more than 240 Earth days. For a long time, scientists believed that the sun's strong pull on Venus was responsible for such a long day. But new theory claims that Venus used to spin just like Earth and the rest of the planets. But at one point, it just flipped its axis 180 degrees. It doesn't mean the planet abruptly stopped halfway through the rotation and started to move backward. When theory suggests that a large comet or object struck the planet in the past. This might have caused it to change the direction of its rotation. But many scientists doubt this theory. If you observe the moon for some time, you may notice that it's the same face staring at you every night. The truth is that the moon does rotate, but very slowly. It takes our planet's natural satellite 27 Earth days to rotate around its axis. Plus, the moon rotates at the same rate that it orbits Earth. The side we always see is called the near side of the moon. And the side that's not facing us is, you guessed it, the far side of the moon. It also has the nickname the dark side of the moon. Uranus's rotation axis is 98 degrees relative to the plane of the solar system, which basically means that the planet spins on its side. For a while, scientists believed that a large object firing through space knocked into Uranus, causing it to tilt. But here's one problem. Uranus's moons are covered in ice. A collision so powerful that it made the planet tilt would have resulted in disrupting the moon's movement and their position. But they seem relatively untouched, and all the ice covering them is still intact. But any major changes happening with Uranus would have generated enough energy to melt the ice. Another reason for Uranus' strange position might be its rings. Yup, Uranus has rings just like Saturn, except they're lighter and fainter. Saturn's rings are mostly billions of chunks of ice and rock floating in orbit. Some particles can be the size of a pebble, while others can reach the size of a house. Wow! Other particles are broken up comets, asteroids, and moons torn apart by Saturn's gravity. If you observe the rings from afar, they look like colorful stripes made up of thousands of different streaks. But there are actually only eight layers of rings. 
Uranus might have had rings that were just as glorious as Saturn's around 4.5 billion years ago. The balance between Saturn's gravity and its rings might be responsible for keeping the planet upright so that it doesn't tilt over. If Uranus had the same rings, they could prevent the planet from toppling over. The way to solve Uranus's tilting problem might be for the planet to get its rings back. They would help Uranus keep its balance. On the other hand, hey, we like it just the way it is. Have you ever wondered what it would be like if every planet in our solar system was the size of Earth? Well, it's time to dive into this mind-boggling scenario. Let's imagine what each planet would look like if they were as big as our beloved blue planet. Would the barren red landscape of Mars suddenly become a lush green oasis? Would the massive swirling gas giant Jupiter just disappear? And how would it affect our solar system as a whole? Are we all doomed? Buckle up and let's find out! The first planet on our list is Mercury, the smallest planet in our solar system. But now, forget about the moon like Mercury. Instead, picture yourself on the surface of a super dynamic incandescent inferno. There are a lot of craters and active volcanoes around you, and right in front of you is a huge, blinding bright sun. What a nightmare! But let's break these changes down. Well, along with the size of Mercury, both its mass and gravity would increase. In that case, it's possible that Mercury would have more atmosphere. Temperatures on Mercury are extreme, not only because it's very close to the Sun, but also because of its very thin atmosphere. So during the day, the temperatures there reach 800 degrees Fahrenheit, and at night, it becomes terrifyingly cold, down to negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. But now, when the gravity is stronger, Mercury could have a denser atmosphere, so the heat would be better distributed across the planet. And the atmosphere isn't the only thing that could make it hotter. If Mercury became bigger, it would likely experience increased internal heating due to gravitational compression. And hypothetically, its tectonic activity could increase. In other words, more interesting landscape, more mountains, and more scary active volcanoes. Congratulations, you've turned Mercury into Venus 2.0. For us, all these changes wouldn't be very pleasant. Now it would become much harder to send our spacecraft there, so it's better for Mercury to stay as it is, small, calm, and boring. Basically, the complete opposite of our next planet, Venus. So what would happen to Venus if it was Earth-sized? Actually, nothing. It wouldn't change at all all because Venus is already almost the size of Earth. It's even called the Earth's twin, although twin is a big word, of course. In reality, we couldn't be more different. Venus is often called the morning star because it's so bright and visible in the sky. But don't let its beauty fool you. This planet is one of the most inhospitable places in our solar system. Its surface is hotter than a freshly baked pizza, around 900 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's covered in thick clouds of sulfuric acid that would dissolve any human who tried to visit. So, unfortunately, you won't be planning any trips there anytime soon. So, let's move on to a planet that, unlike Venus, could potentially become a new home for us, Mars. Picture yourself standing on Mars's surface, watching the blue sunset and breathing in a refreshing breeze of air. Yes, you read that right, air. Moreover, you could be surrounded by plants, animals, and basically feel like you're on Earth. But how is that possible? Bigger Mars would have a stronger magnetic field and gravity. This would lead to a richer and denser atmosphere. It would likely have a wider range of gases, including oxygen. Wouldn't that be cool? Also, a denser atmosphere could distribute heat across the planet, so Mars would become much warmer and cozier. And here comes the most important change, liquid water. Mars actually has some frozen water at its poles and in subsurface reservoirs. But with a stronger gravitational pull, it could potentially stabilize liquid water on its surface. Hooray! However, it's not all fun and games. New Mars would also have a volcanic personality. It's already geologically active, but now its internal heat and pressure would skyrocket. That means more frequent and more crazy volcanic eruptions. 
Imagine how exciting it would be to witness such eruptions on another planet, if you managed to escape the consequences. In general, the planet could become greener and lusher, but not safer, although it would still be great to see it. But it's time to move on to the giants of our solar system. And if we're enlarging the planets before, now it's time to squeeze them really, really hard. If Jupiter became 11 times smaller, oh boy, what a disaster that would be. The first thing we'd notice is a change in gravity. And I say we'd notice because now we'd have no choice but to move somewhere. Jupiter experiences from 30 to 100 collisions with large asteroids per year. No big deal? All because of its strongest gravity, which attracts them all and protects us. But now our big protective brother has turned into a small baby. Say hi to a bunch of asteroids! Oh, and say bye-bye to Jupiter. This planet is known for its thick, swirling atmosphere. But with a weaker gravitational pull, Jupiter would probably have a hard time holding on to it. So over time, it would slowly escape into space leaving behind a thin atmosphere composed mainly of nitrogen and oxygen. We'll also have to bid farewell to the iconic appearance of another giant, Saturn. The most noticeable difference would be the disappearance of its famous rings. Made up of small particles of ice and rock, the rings are a unique feature of Saturn. But with Earth's gravity, they would either fall onto the planet or scatter into space. Bummer. Saturn is also a gas giant, just like Jupiter. Its atmosphere is made up of mostly hydrogen and helium. But if it were Earth-sized, its gases would be compressed due to the increased gravity. This would make it much denser. That means Saturn's overall size and shape would change. Theoretically, if we squeeze Saturn hard, it could potentially become a brown dwarf. It's a type of failed star that lacks the mass to sustain nuclear fusion but emits heat and light. So, Saturn could stop being a planet altogether. The weather on it would probably have changed too. All its crazy storms, such as the famous hexagonal storm at its North Pole, would have become weaker and calmer. The next giant is Uranus. Let's try to compress this poor fella. First off, the surface gravity on Uranus would be much weaker than it is now. Its atmosphere might also change. If Uranus was smaller, it could have a thinner atmosphere and different gases altogether. This planet is pretty chilly, with an average temperature of negative 353 degrees Fahrenheit. Ugh. But if it was the size of Earth, it might actually warm up a bit due to its reduced volume to surface area ratio. Don't get too excited though, it would still be way colder than the coldest spots on Earth. As you can see, Gas giants don't easily go through all this shrinking, except perhaps one of them. Surprisingly, small Neptune would become much friendlier. For starters, it would probably be a rocky planet with a tiny atmosphere. That means no more gas giant, but instead a planet that's easier for humans and critters alike to live and move around on. Speaking of movement, because of the smaller size, the gravity on this new Neptune would be almost the same as Earth's making it a heck of a lot easier to walk and jump around. No more floating away into space. Now, the atmosphere of the original Neptune is so thick you could barely see your hand in front of your face. And the surface pressure is about 100 times that of Earth's atmosphere. But our new Neptune would be much different, with a much thinner and less dense atmosphere. It would still have some methane, water, and ammonia in it, but nowhere near as much as before. Finally, the temperature. <laughs> the current Neptune is freezing, with an average temperature of about negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit. But if it was the same size as Earth, it would likely be much warmer, just like Uranus. Ah, that's more like it. What a planet that would be. That's it for the changes in the planets. But what would happen to the entire solar system if we made all the planets so small? It's hard to predict, but it's clear that their gravity and orbits could change a lot. It's unlikely that any of them would have flown into outer space, or crashed into each other, or something like that. But many of their orbits would probably become quite unstable, and the number of collisions with asteroids would have increased significantly. Of course all this is purely speculation, it's not like we can actually test all this. 
but it's still a pretty interesting thought experiment, and it makes you appreciate just how unique and special our solar system really is. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.